Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the sources of bargaining power. Essentially, I'm going to outline the remainder of this course, both what appears in the video lecture series and also what appears in the associated textbook, Game Theory 101 Bargaining, which you can learn more about by clicking on the video description. In any case, the sources of bargaining power that we'll be learning about in this course are as follows. Proposal power, patience, outside options, knowledge of the other side's minimum value, having monopoly power, having a reputation for toughness, having the ability to issue credible commitments, and also having the ability to issue costly signals of higher value. If you can do any of those things, or if you have any of those things, you're going to end up in a better place after negotiations end than you would be without having these things. Obviously, because this course is long and the book is long, understanding and applying any one of these particular things isn't going to be the easiest thing in the world. We're going to spend a lot of time trying to learn these things here. So what I'm going to do for the remainder of this lecture is give you at least some sort of intuition about why these things are important. And then, of course, we'll spend the rest of the lectures understanding precisely why it's the case and proving that any one of these things actually does improve bargaining power. So let's start off with the first, proposal power. Proposal power is the thing that we're going to spend the most time covering because it is more critical than anything else that you'll see on this list. Proposal power is the ability to make offers to the other side. So if we're negotiating, that would be like me saying, let's settle for $20, or let's settle for $22, or let's settle for $50. This is me actually making and issuing the terms of the settlement. In contrast, if your ability is to only say yes or no to an agreement to accept or reject an offer, that's going to be no good. If all you can do is say yes or no, you're going to be either not any better off after negotiations end or only very slightly better off after negotiations end than before negotiations started in the first place. On the other hand, if you have the exclusive ability to make offers to the other side to propose divisions like $20 or $50 and so forth, then you're going to reap almost all of the benefits, if not all of the benefits, of the negotiated solution. Proposal power, as I said, is hugely critical and so as a result, again, we're going to spend most of our time in this course, not most of the time in this course, but rather more on this one issue, proposal power, than any other issue that you'll see in this course. Moving on, patience is critical. So if I do not need to reach a deal, if I am not desperate to reach a deal, then I'm going to get a better deal. On the other hand, if I really need a deal to happen, if I can't wait very long for this deal to be sealed, then I'm going to be in a very bad position and the other side is going to be able to take advantage of me as a result. This is sometimes called the tragedy of bargaining and we'll learn more about this. In other words, the rich are going to get richer as a result of patience being so important. That is obviously a very bad thing, right? This is not how you would want to construct the world. If you could, if you could restart how the world works, you would not want to create a world that incentivizes the rich getting richer. And yet that's exactly what we see here in unconstrained bargaining relationships is that the person who needs the deal the most is going to get the worst end of the deal. Outside options, another important part of bargaining. If you and I are negotiating, but if negotiations fail between the two of us, I can go to a third party and receive some sort of deal from that third party. If I have a competitive offer from that third party, that's going to force you to be nicer to me in our negotiated relationship because you do not want me to leave our bargain and try to bargain with this third guy. Having the outside option, me having the ability to go to that third guy forces you to give me concessions, which is good for me. Related to that, monopoly power is important. I don't mean monopoly power exactly in the same way as we think about this traditionally, where there's just one business that is the only person that can sell goods to people in an economic relationship. What I mean closer to this is if we're bargaining and I present something that's unique, if I have a unique ability that no one else can replace, and I'm negotiating with you, but I could also go negotiate with somebody else, when I have this unique quality that both of you want, both you and the other guy I could be bargaining, this is going to result in me getting all of the benefits of the economic relationship. And if I don't receive all of the benefits of the economic relationship for a particular reason that we'll see later on, I'm still going to get a really awesome deal out of it compared to what I would be able to get if I was easily replaceable. 
Reputation, also important. If I have a reputation to protect, I'll get a better deal. You can think about this in terms of a hotshot lawyer or a union negotiator, someone who goes around from case to case trying to negotiate a better deal for his or her constituency. If I'm this hotshot lawyer who has this reputation to protect of getting a really good deal, that's going to force the other side to offer me better deals for me to be able to settle or to be willing to settle uh, short of a solution that is implemented via a court. Moving on, credible commitment. This one's good, and this is one of my favorite topics. If you can willfully break an agreement, this can cause no agreement to occur, even though both of us would be better off if the agreement occurred and we actually followed through on it. What that means in turn is that contracts are good. If we can negotiate a solution in a legally enforceable way, where if you break the agreement, I can go take you to court. That's going to force you to follow through on the agreement, which then in turn makes us more willing to sign the agreement in the first place and avoid a situation where we both could benefit and yet neither one of us does because we're worried about someone breaking the agreement later on. The flip side of this, of course, is that black markets are very bad. If you don't have this rule of law, if you're stuck, say, in the drug trade or something like that, it's going to be much more difficult for you to come up with these agreements because people know that it's possible that you might break them later on. Moving on, knowledge is power. If you know the other side's bottom line, you're going to be able to get deals closer to it. The flip side, if you don't know the other side's bottom line, you have to choose between two bad options. You have to choose the lesser of two evils. Option one is that you offer an amount that you're sure is going to be accepted, but that's going to be very costly for you because you're going to have to give up more or ask for less in order to make sure that everyone that you could possibly be negotiating with will be willing to accept that deal. The other choice is that you make a very aggressive offer and a very aggressive demand and try to take as much as you can from the bargaining relationship. And when that works, it pays off very nicely because you're demanding so much, but it's going to backfire more often precisely because you're issuing this very hard line negotiating negotiation stance, and that's going to cause a lot of people to be turned off and leave the economic relationship. Finally, costly signaling is something that most people don't understand, at least in terms of formal theory, but if you work it out, people will find this very fascinating. So signals that you are worth more can lead to better offers. This is contrary to a cheap talk situation. A cheap talk situation is where I just say, hey, I'm really special, you should give me a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. We're going to be talking about signaling in the sense that I can do something as someone who's valuable that someone who is not valuable can do. What we'll see is that it might actually make sense to spend a little bit of money to make a little bit of money because you're going to be showing off the other side that you're this really good, really powerful, really strong type. So those are the different sources of bargaining power that we're going to be learning about in this course. And in the next lecture, starting in the next lecture, we'll actually get to it, kicking things off with learning about proposal power. Hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you next time. Take care.